Hello. I'm the generation who keeps all the ice cream boxes and butter and cream cheese tubs made from heavy, sturdy plastics. It feels bad to me to throw them away because they are still perfectly useful. You know, I'm from a simpler time and place. I was born in the 60s in what was then Czechoslovakia. I spent most of my childhood in a tiny village of 500 souls. It's in the southern agricultural part of Slovakia, surrounded by lush fields. Most villagers had blue-collar jobs and small gardens where they were producing food for their own consumption. So did we. We drank tap water, preserved the fruit and vegetables from the garden in reusable glass jars. Food didn't have best before dates at the time. We just used our best judgment. <laughs> whether it is still okay to eat. My mother would make cottage cheese from sour milk and uh, the dry bread on any leftovers we fed to the animals. Our shopping habits were different too. The shop had only one type of bread, <laughs> which was sold without any package, and we would buy fresh goods such as bread and dairy every day. And we would have big shopping like once a month when my Mother made a careful shopping list, and most of the time we also had a budget. If something got broken, like the refrigerator or the washing machine or the TV, they were still repairmen who we called to repair it. And well, even though we had, I remember it was a biggish galvanized steel waste bin, there wasn't that much in it. We had central eating in our house. And uh, there we would be burning mainly coal and wood, and my father would burn anything that is combustible. On one famous occasion, even my mother's shoes, but that's a different story for, for now. So what we had in the bin, it was mainly ash and things that we really, really could not use, like broken glass and china. Well, on the other hand, there was no organized waste collection at that time and the villagers were dumping their waste in an open pit. It was the 70s, heydays of polyester production and platform shoes, but also the birth of environmental consciousness and the declaration of the first European Waste Directive, the Waste Framework Directive in 1975. Well, fast forward to 2020. I now live in the north of Finland, 200 kilometers away from the Arctic Circle. I'm a professor at the University of Oulu. I work late hours, but I still like to cook. I consider myself a master of 15-minute meals, which rely on pre-processed ingredients. My husband and I, we buy most of our food packaged in plastic bags and boxes and caps and cups and some steel can and glass jars. Our waste bin looks very different <laughs> from that of my parents. Well, to start with, we have not one but six waste bins. My husband and I, we are quite eager to recycle, and we utilize the really excellent opportunities the Finnish waste management si system offers us. We would separate cardboard, newspaper, glass, metal, plastic packaging, and batteries which we have a chance to drop off free of charge in any of the collection centers next to big supermarkets. And the mixed waste is collected from our house once a week. You can say that I have come a long way, literally, but so did Europe in the last 45 years since that first waste framework directive. That directive has meanwhile been renewed three times, and there is an addition of 15 different directives and regulations and acts about different waste streams and waste management operations. And also, luckily, waste no longer ends up in open pits. And even from my small village, recyclables are now collected. But despite my effort to retain as much useful as possible, you might say it's slight hoarding habit, I still generate a lot more waste. And, well, almost everybody else is generating a lot more waste now than in the 70s. The amounts of waste have increased steadily in Europe for about 30 years since the 70s. What's the reason of it? Well, when is the last time you had a 
really deep look into your own waste bin, what's in it. My bin would have a lot of plastic bags and wrappers, which the cheese and ham came in, bread bags, yogurt cups, milk cartons, some food waste too, yes, but I have more packaging than food waste because I use pre-processed ingredients. In general, there is an adverse relation between packaging waste and food waste. The more packaging, the less food waste. If I were to make, say, a vegetable stir-fry, I would have onion peels and paprika cores and broccoli stalks and zucchini stems. Instead, I buy a frozen veggie mix where the vegetables are already readily diced and sliced and takes me all of seven minutes to prepare and then I only have that plastic bag. So packaging makes my life easier, certainly. Historically, packaging were developed because the production and consumption of goods took place in different times and places. Urbanization and later international trade resulted in goods being distributed to ever larger distances. Well, the most important purpose of packaging is to deliver the goods to you, to us, to me, to protect and deliver. So if I see packaging in my waste bin, it's just an indication and a sign that food, for example, such as cheese and ham and tomatoes, have safely landed in my refrigerator. Still, packaging have a bad reputation, and it started in the 70s when littering was recognized as an environmental problem. The unsightly image of fast food boxes and candy wrappers, plastic bags and bottles, on streets and forest paths and beaches, and the sheer amount of packaging resulted in that packaging was the first waste group that was mandated to be recycled in Europe. The 1995 Packaging Maze Directive mandates that by 2025, 65% of all packaging waste will have to be uh, recycled. More recycling directives followed, but the amount of waste going to landfill was still increasing in the 90s. The real change happened further to the landfill directive from 1995, which aims to ban landfilling of biodegradables such as food waste and recyclables such as packaging in landfill. The first highlight or the first kind of goal to reach was to halve the disposal of these recyclables by 2009. And to manage with that, the solution was that many European countries, Finland included, started incinerating their waste. So after that, it's only the ash which is going to landfill. The amount of waste didn't change, mind you, but more of it is utilized. Currently, we generate about five kilo of waste per person per week, on average worldwide. In Finland, this number is closer to 10. 10 kilo per person per week. Well, then again, you can say we have an excellent waste management system, so is it then good? Are we good? Well, Finland indeed has a world-class waste management system. It's two main reasons. One, because we are strong in, waste, in uh, metallurgy and paper industry, so they are recipient facilities for those waste streams. Finns have been recycling metals since 1914, and cardboard since 1940. The second, that Finns are very nicely responding to all European legislation and putting it to national legislation, and we actually managed to build a nice collection system which is able to capture all of this. The third ingredient would be the people, their awareness, and willingness to participate and actually use those channels. Well, unfortunately, it's not exactly so. Finnish households separate only about one third of their waste for recycling. The bigger part, the two thirds, is tightly packed and knotted into nice plump plastic bags and dumped in the mixed waste bin, which is then incinerated. So what's in them, you might ask? I can tell you. 
environmental engineering students of our University of Oulu had the chance to open these bags at the waste management company and manually sort their soggy, stinky, <laughs> putrid contents. Well, they had protective gear, mind you. But the result was staggering. A shocking 75% of the mixed waste is recyclables. One quarter, about 25% is food waste. Some of it is your typical kitchen waste, like potato peels, eggshells, coffee grains. But the large part is just uneaten food, wasted food. <coughs> Cooked meals, leftovers, dry bread, molding cheese and wilted vegetables, rotting fruit. Well, what does that tell about us? What does this amount of waste tell about it? It's quite a lot, quite a lot. The amount of waste we generate and the content of it can, for example, say where you live, whether it is in a city apartment or in a countryside where you have a garden, whether you like to cook or prefer ready meals, whether you have kids or pets, for example. But most importantly, it speaks volumes about our consumption habits. The waste with its amount and volume, it's only a symptom. It is the symptom of consumption. It is not the reason of the pollution that is ultimately going to be damaging our environment. It's the result of it. The reason is consumption. So if waste is a symptom, consumption is the disease. And you can't treat a disease by only treating the symptoms. You have to go to the core of the problem. And the core of the problem is unfortunately that consumption habits in high income countries such as Finland are unsustainable. If everybody consumed as much as Finns do, we would need four Earths. That's not just planet B, that planet C and D as well. We have now reached the stage that 60% of the Earth's ecosystem have been severely degraded by human activities. And we are consuming 50% more than the Earth can replenish. Last year, in 2019, Humanity has reached Earth Overshoot Day in July 29th. That means that by the end of July, we have consumed Earth's entire year's budget of natural resources. You know, I've been doing waste management research for over 25 years now, and I used to think that everybody should do the environment as much as they want to. Of course, I would hope that everybody would dispose their waste in the right bin rather than just dump it where they stand. And I promise you, it does make a difference if everybody would separate their recyclables. But I no longer believe this is enough. Just handling our waste is not enough. If generating waste is bad, then recycling is less bad. But doing less bad is not good enough. We have to do the right thing. And the right thing is sustainable consumption, which means satisfying our needs and have a good life, but without exhausting the Earth's resources and without polluting the environment. For that, number one, we need to distinguish between needs and wants. You know, it's easy to blame the packaging industry or the plastics industry for the pollution. It's much more difficult to admit that it's me, my lifestyle, my consumption habits that are polluting the environment. And you know, there is all this legislation who says that I should recycle waste, but there is no legislation that is stopping me from consuming more. Quite the opposite. I'm encouraged to consume more by advertisement and offers, but there's the needs and wants. Brilliant Black Friday needs, <laughs> Black Friday offers, but do I really need a new TV? Or oh, there is a clear ad saying every, everything 50% off, but do I really need five new items of clothing? You know, there is 7.5 billion people on this earth, and everybody wants to satisfy 
their needs and wants and have a good life. But unfortunately, I don't have, even though I had made this 25 years of research, I wish I had an easier solution, but there is no easy solution for the equation that we are living with a deficit and still everybody wants more. And to change that, we need that sustainable mindset. To be more mindful about what we buy, how much we buy, and what we do with it. But I'm here to tell you that you can make a difference. Your choices matter. It matters for yourself, it matters for the planet, and it matters for what kind of future we leave behind for our children. Thank you.